Good evening, everyone. I'm David Lynn, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 2019 Denham Sutcliffe Memorial Lecture. As always, this is the final event of the Kenyon Review Literary Festival. It's been a wonderful week in a community and at a liberal arts college where literature and great writing form part of our sinews. Since this will be my last year hosting this event, I'm going to indulge in a few well-deserved shout-outs before we proceed to tonight's speaker. First with us tonight is Bob Palmer. Where's Bob? Right there. A Kenyan alumnus and devoted student of the legendary English professor, Denham Sutcliffe. Thanks to Bob's leadership and generosity, a literary fund was established in honor of Professor Sutcliffe, and for a dozen years it has made possible these keynote addresses as a signal part of the annual literary festival. I also want to mention with praise John Chittister, the longtime director of the Public Library of Mount Vernon and Knox County. For over 30 years, John has been a staunch yet diplomatic uh, defender of literature and education and he has been a most wonderful collaborator and supporter of our literary festival. John, thank you. Two Ohio-based trustees of the Kenyon Review are joining us again this evening, Jim Finn and Bob Hallinan. Where are they hiding? There's Bob. Um, they too are Kenyon alums and my dear friends, and we want to acknowledge how their energy and passion have, have contributed so much to our literary community. Finally, these sponsors, businesses, and organizations have helped make the Lit Fest possible. The Ariel uh, Corporation, the Knox County Foundation, First Knox National Bank, the Denham Sutcliffe Memorial Lecture Series, the People's Bank, Mount Vernon News, Ohio Arts Council. And additional support was provided by the Public Library of Mount Vernon and Knox County, Kenyon College Bookstore, <coughs> Paragraphs Bookstore, the Kenyon College English Department, and these individuals, Anna Duke Reach, Tori Weber, Elizabeth Dark, Sergei Lobanov Rostovsky, Tyler Hubler, Alicia Misarty, John Pickard, Kirsten Reach, and Abigail Surface, as well as the many participants as well as the many participants of this week's events and more Kenyon Review associates and interns than I could possibly mention here. After T.C. Boyle's remarks, there will be a question and answer period, and you will then have the chance to buy some of Mr. Boyle's books in the foyer outside Brandy uh, Recital Hall and to have him sign them for you. Now comes the central event of the <coughs> evening, a chance to honor, celebrate, and sit at, sit at the feet, as it were, of our special guest, T.C. Boyle, a.k.a. T. Carragason Boyle, a.k.a. Tom Boyle one of the most innovative, clear-eyed, funny, and challenging novelists and story writers in America. The truth, I confess, is that T.C. Boyle's stories creep me out. <laughs> over and over again, rather ordinary characters, fully realized and entirely persuasive, find themselves in situations of extreme, of excess, of eerie strangeness. One, be one becomes insatiably addicted to reliving, or at least reviewing, scenes from his own past. Another lives in a world of unchecked genetic perfections, leading to dog-cat hybrids and towering teenage girls with soaring IQs and iridescent eyes. Or there's the family living in quarters overrun by Argentine ants, which are, as you might imagine, quite unstoppable. Since the 1970s, T.C. Boyle has published, by my count, 28 extraordinary books, among them World's End, The Tortilla Curtain, A Friend of the Earth, and Outside Looking In. His literary awards include the Penn Faulkner Prize for Best Novel of the Year, the Penn Malamud Prize in the short story, and the Prix Medici Etranger for Best Foreign Novel in France. I'm especially pleased to tell you that two nights ago in New York, T.C. Boyle received the 2019 Kenyon Review Award for Literary Achievement. Please join me in welcoming Tom Boyle. Oh, 
Sean spoke. It's only me. <laughs> uh, thanks. I'm honored and delighted. I love being here today, although somebody could turn the heat up a little bit outside. <laughs> um, I stepped down from my professorship at USC, I think four years ago, and I was coaching David on his coming retirement. Um, I don't like the word retired. I prefer the term pre-dead. <laughs> what they didn't tell me was that I don't get spring break anymore. <laughs> I, of course, I still do have my day job, so it's okay. Uh, I love being here on campus. I love talking with the students today. And what I love to do most of all is to turn you on to fiction. I love to read aloud to an audience. Uh, it takes us back to the first voice we ever heard, in my case, my mother, who taught me how to read because I was too squirrely to sit still in school. Um, and it's kind of magical, I think, if, uh, if you let it happen. Um, I should say, too, that uh, when I was a student in Iowa, we had gatherings like this weekly, and all of our heroes and, and heroines and famous writers came through town, and we got a chance to see just what they were really like. And of course, they were all drug addicts, drunks, and uh, psychotics, <laughs> but that was okay. <laughs> um, I remember one occasion, when Stanley Oakham came to town. I'm sure you remember Stanley Oakham, a very funny, uh, wicked a comic novelist. We students knew not to stand within the first three rows because of the flying spittle, as Stanley worked himself into an actor's rage. He was very funny and very great. And in the Q&A afterwards, and you know, I'm just an innocent student wanting hope for the future. And someone asked him, <laughs> Stanley, uh, Mr. Oakham, um, you've written this wonderful, book of stories, uh, Criers and Kibitzers, Kibitzers and Criers, uh, are you going to write another? And he said, no money in it. Next question. <laughs> and it was a little bit deflated for us. I mean, we are artists. We're working because we feel compelled to make art, whether there's money in it or not. Um, some of us are lucky. And sometimes somebody will buy something that you produce. It's a great miracle. So tonight I'm going to give you two stories. The first one, you already know because it's part of the real box in my latest collection, and it was also published in Kenyan Review. It's called The Five Pound Burrito. And students often wonder where do you get ideas. Well, this one came from an obituary in the LA Times. I live in Santa Barbara, incidentally. Um, it was of a guy who owned a burrito shop in Boyle Heights. Um, he had been there many, many years, and then he passed on. Uh, his distinction, though, was he was the creator of the five-pound burrito. <laughs> you know, we all want to leave a legacy behind. We all hope to, whether it's through children or business associates or improving the environment or making art. Well, this was his legacy. I never went there. I never met him. Although, by the way, reading this story around the country, people have come up and said, yeah, I went there, I had that burrito. <laughs> so I, I wondered, what would it be like? And this story will take you by surprise. About halfway through, it would take off like a rocket ship, so don't fall asleep, okay? <laughs> the five pound burrito. He lived in a world of grease, and no matter how often he bathed, which was once a day, rigorously, and no shower, but a drawn bath. He smelled of carnitas, machaca, and the chopped white onion and soapy cilantro he folded each morning into his, into his pico de gallo. The grease itself was worked up under his nails and into the folds of his skin, folds that hung looser and penetrated deeper now that he was no longer young. This was a condition of his life and his livelihood, and it had its drawbacks. He was 62 and never married because what woman would want a man who smelled so inveterately of fried pork? It had its rewards, too. For one thing, he was his own boss. The little hole in the wall cafe he'd opened back in the 60s, still doing business when so many showier places had come and gone. For another, he was content. His world restricted to what he knew, the sink, the dishwasher, the griddle, and the grill. And he sold his customers, the regulars and one-timers alike, as a kind of flock that had to be fed like the chickens his mother had kept when he was a boy. What did he do with himself? He scraped the griddle, took his aprons, shirts, and underwear to the Chinese laundry that had been in operation nearly as long as he had, and went home each evening to put his feet up and sit in front of the TV. His only employee was a young woman, was a sour woman named Sepidae, 
an Iranian, or as she preferred it, Persian immigrant who had escaped her native country after the regime change, and was between 45 and 60, depending on what time of day you asked her. In the mornings, she was incomparably old, but by closing time, her age had dropped, though she dragged her feet, her shoulders slumped, and her makeup grew increasingly tragic. She was dark-skinned and dark-eyed, and she dyed her once black hair black all over again. People took her for a Mexican, which was really a matter of indifference to him. He didn't care whether the waitress was from Chipotepec or Hokkaido, as long as she did her job and took some of the pressure off him. And she did, and had for some 20 years and counting. On this particular day, midway, midweek, dreary, the downtown skyline obliterated by fog or smog or whatever they wanted to call it, Seven day was late because the bus she took from the section of town known as Little Persia, where she lived with her mother and an equally sour-faced brother he'd met once or twice, had broken down. As luck would have it, there was a line outside the door when at 11 o'clock on the dot, he shuffled across the floor and flipped the sign from closed to open. In came the customers, most of them wearing familiar faces, and as they crowded in at the counter and unfolded their newspapers and propped up their tablets and laptops on the six tables arranged in a narrow line along the far wall that featured the framed black and white photo of a dead president, he began taking orders. First in line was Scott, a student from the university who had the same thing five days a week, black <coughs> coffee and a chorizo and scrambled egg burrito. He lathered with jalapenos just to wake up, as he put it, on the mornings when he was capable of speech. Next to him were Umberto and Baltasar, two baggy pants old men from the neighborhood who would slurp heavily sugared coffee for the next three hours and try to talk him to death as he hustled from grill to griddle to the refrigerator and back. And here were two others settling into stools beside them, new faces, more students, but big, all head and neck, shoulder and belly, footballers, no doubt, who would devour everything in a two-foot radius, complain that the portions were too small and the burritos like prisoners' rations and try to suck the glaze off the plates in the process. Of course, he should be happy because the students had discovered him again. And how many generations had made the same discovery then faded away in the lean months when he could have used their business? He dealt out a stack of plastic menus as if he were flipping cards like the dealer at the blackjack table at Caesars where he liked to spend his two weeks off every February. Bathed in the little spotlight that illuminated the table, a gratis rum and coke sizzling at his elbow. Then he leaned over the counter and announced in the voice that was dying in his throat a little more each day as he groped toward old age and infirmity, no table service today. You people back there got to come up to the counter if you want to get fed. That was it. He didn't need to give an explanation. If they wanted Michelin stars, let them line up over in Beverly Hills or Pacific Palisades. But he couldn't help adding, she's late today, seven day. And so it began. Breakfast, then the lunch rush furious work in a pop cramped kitchen, and all he could see was people's mouths opening and closing, and the great wads of beans and rice and marinated pork, chicken and beef swelling their throats. It was past noon before he could catch his breath. He didn't even have time for a cigarette, and that put him in a foul mood, the lack of nicotine. And when he saw the face in the tortilla that provided the foundation for the burrito he was just then constructing, he ignored it. It was nobody's face. Eyes, nose, cheekbones, brow, and it meant nothing except that he was exhausted, already exhausted, and he still had six and a half hours to go. And sure, he'd seen faces before, Muhammad, the Buddha, Sandy Koufax once, but Jesus, never. <clears throat> the woman over on Broadway had seen Jesus exactly as he was in the Shroud of Turin, only the Shroud in this case was made of unleavened flour, lard, and water. He could have used Jesus himself because that woman got rich and the, the lines for her place went around the whole city block. If he only had Jesus, he could hire somebody more competent and dependable than Sepidae and sit back and take a load off. That was what he was thinking as he smeared refritos over the face of the tortilla and piled up rice and meat and guacamole and crema, cheese, shredded lettuce, pico de gallo, the works, and why not? For yet another pair of footballers who were sitting there at the back table like statues come to life. Call it whimsy or maybe revenge. But he mounted the ingredients up till the burrito was as big as a stuffed pillowcase. Let them complain about this one. That was when he had his moment of inspiration, divine or otherwise. He would weigh it, actually weigh it. And this would be his ammunition and his pride too, the biggest burrito in town. If he didn't have Jesus, at least he would have that. We each, 
We each live through our time on Earth in an accumulation of milliseconds, seconds, minutes, hours, days, months, and years, and life is a path we must follow inevitably to the end. Is there change or the hope of it? Yes, but change is wearing and bad for the nerves and almost always for the worse. So it was with Sal, the American-born son of Mexican immigrants, who'd opened Salvador's cafe with a loan from his uncle James when he was still in his 20s, and now, nearly 40 years later, saw his business take off like a rocket on the fuel of the five-pound burrito. <laughs> Suddenly, his homely cafe was a destination not only for his regulars and the famished and greedy of the neighborhood, but for the educated classes from the west side who pulled up out front in their shining new German automobiles and stepped through the door as if they expected the floor to fall away beneath the soles of their running shoes and suck them down to some deeper, darker place. This was change, positive change, at least at first. He hired a man to help with the dishes and the sweeping up, and a second waitress, a young girl studying for her nursing degree who gave everybody in the place something to look at. And on the counter, raised at eye level on a cloth-covered pedestal, was the big butcher scale on which he ceremoniously weighed each dripping pork, chicken, or beef burrito before Sepede, or the new girl, Marta, made a show of hefting the supersized plate and setting it down laboriously in front of the customer who had ordered it. A man from the newspaper came. And then another. The line went round the block, and never mind Jesus. Sal was there early one morning. Typically, he arose at five and was in the kitchen by six, preparing things ahead of time. And of course, with success came the need for yet more preparation. When he felt a numinous shift in the atmosphere, as if all those first timers from the west side had been right after all. The floor didn't open up beneath him, of course, but as he cut meat from the bone and shucked avocados for guacamole, he felt the atmosphere permeated by a new presence, and no ordinary presence, but the kind that makes a dog's hackles rise when it sniffs the shadows. For a moment, he felt dizzy and wondered if he was having some sort of attack, the inevitable myocardial infarction or stroke that would bring him down for good. But the dizziness passed, and he found himself in the kitchen still, the knife clenched in his hand and the cubes of pork gently oozing on the chopping block before him. He shook his head to clear it. Something was different, but he couldn't say what. The morning wore on in a fugue of chopping, dicing, and tearing up over the emanations of habaneras and jalapenos, his back aching and his hands dripping with the juice of the hundred millionth tomato of his resuscitated life, and he forgot all about it till the knock came at the alley door. This was the knock of Stanford Wong, who delivered produce to the restaurants of the neighborhood and was as punctual as the great clock in Greenwich, England that kept time for the world. Sal wiped his hands on his apron and hurried in the door because Stanford, understandably, didn't like to be delayed. There might have been a noise outside the door, a furtive scratching of an, of a, as of an animal trying to get in, but it didn't register until he pulled back the door and saw that it wasn't Stanford stationed there at all, but an erect five and a half foot rooster dressed in Stanford Wong's khaki shorts and khaki shirt with a black plastic name tag, Stanford, fixed over its breast. Was he taken aback? <laughs> was he seeing things? He'd had his breakfast, hadn't he? Yes, yes, of course, eggs. Chicken embryos, fried in butter, topped with a sprinkle of cotija cheese and served up on toast. He just stood there, blinking. But the bird, which somehow seemed to have hands as well as wings, was impatient and brushed by him with a crate of lettuce and half a dozen clear plastic bags of tomatillos, peppers, and the like balanced against his, its, chest, setting the load down on the counter and swinging round abruptly with Stanford's receipt book in hand. But there were words now, the bird saying something out of a beak that snapped and glistened to show off a pink wedge of tongue, and yet the words made no sense unless you were to interpret them in the usual way. Same order tomorrow, and you take care now. <coughs> the door swung shut. The crate sat astride the counter, just as it had yesterday and the day before and the day before that. It took him a moment, and maybe he'd better have another cup of coffee. Before he went to the crate and began shoving heads of lettuce into the refrigerator, all the while thinking that there were two possibilities here. The first and most obvious was that he was hallucinating. The second and more disturbing was that Stanford Wong had been transformed into a giant rooster. <laughs> Either way, the prospects could hardly be called favorable. And if he was losing his mind in the uproar over the five pound burrito, who could blame him? Next, it was Sepede, dressed in a black skirt and white blouse, but with her head covered in feathers and her nose replaced by a dull puce beak and no shoes on her feet because her legs, her scaly yellow legs, 
supported not phalanges and painted toenails, but the splayed naked clothes of an antediluvian hen. She was never talking, especially in the morning, but whatever she had to say to him came in a series of irritable clucks and gabbles, and he just, well, he just blew her off. Then came Marta. And she was a hen, too. And by the time Oscar Monti, the cleanup man, showed his face, it was no surprise at all that he should be a rooster just like Stanford Wong. And for that matter, once the door opened for business, that all the male customers should be crowing and flapping their wings while their female counterparts clucked and brooded and held their own counsel over pocketbooks stuffed with eyeliner, compact, and lipstick that had no discernible purpose. Something was wrong here, desperately wrong. But work was work, and whether he could understand what anybody was saying, customers or staff, really didn't matter. As everything by this juncture had been reduced to routine, spread the tortilla, crown it with toppings, fold it, dip the ladle in the salsa verde, and serve it up on the big white scale. That was Monday. Mondays were always a trial, what with forcing yourself back into the routine after the day of rest. The Lord's Day, when people went to church to dip their fingers in holy water and count their blessings. Sal looked up. Sal, Sal locked up after work that night, and if he noticed that everyone, every living man, woman, and child on the streets and sealed behind the windows of their cars was a member of a different species, poultry that is, he didn't let it affect him. Even so, the minute he came in the door of his apartment, he went straight to the mirror in the bathroom and was relieved to see his own human face staring back at him out of drooping eyes. He poured himself a drink that night, a practice he found himself engaging in less and less as he got older, heated up a burrito, regular size, in the microwave, and watched reality TV till he couldn't hold his eyes open anymore. It would be one thing to say that his dreams were populated with hens, roosters, and bobbing chicks, but the fact was that he dreamed of nothing, or nothing he could remember on waking. He was a blank canvas, tabula rasa. Mechanically, he shaved. Mechanically, he broke two eggs in a pan and laid three strips of bacon beside them, and he drove mechanically to work in the dark. When Stanford Wong's knock came precisely at eight, Sal moved briskly to the door, his mind soaring on his second cup of coffee and the prospect of yet another record-setting day. If things kept up like this, he'd soon be sitting in a chair all day long, watching the world come and go while the new real man he'd hire and train himself did the dirty work. And it was all due to the inspiration of that day, six months back, when he brought out the scale and piled up the burrito and made his statement to the world, the five-pound burrito. It was a concept, an innovation unmatched by anybody in the city, whether they had a sit-down place or a lunch cart or even one of those eateries with the white tablecloths with the waiters who looked at you as if you belonged on the plate instead of sitting upright in a chair and putting in an order. People just couldn't understand what it took to consume a burrito of that size. No individual, not even the greediest, most swollen footballer, could even ever hope to get it all down in a single setting. Though people placed bets, and Sal had agreed to advertise that if you could manage to eat the whole thing, it was on the house. Very few could. In fact, only one man, skinny, Asian, the size of a child, was able to accomplish the feat incontrovertibly, and it turned out that he was a world-famous competitive eater who'd won the Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Contest three years running. <laughs> <laughs> but here was Sanford Wong's knock, and as Sal opened the door, he didn't know what to expect, least of all what he saw standing there before him on its hind legs, his hind legs. This wasn't Stanford Wong, and it wasn't a chicken either. No, this was a hog with pinched little hog's eyes and a bristling inflamed snout. But it was dressed in Stanford Wong's khaki shirt and shorts with a black plastic nameplate fixed over the breast. It, he, trotted brusquely into the kitchen and set the crate of lettuce and plastic bags of vegetables on the counter, then swung round with Stanford Wong's accounts ledger clutched under one arm and grunted and snuffled out a sentence or two that could only have meant how they hanging? And see you tomorrow, same order, right? Right. So he chopped peppers and grilled pork and made a pot of albondiga soup, shredded lettuce, and stirred up yesterday's steam trays of rice and refritos and thought nothing of it, when Sepide appeared as a grunting old sow in her black skirt and white blouse, and then Marta, resplendent in red shorts and a clinging top in her guise as a smooth pink young shoat who nonetheless stood five feet seven inches tall on her cloven hoofs and managed to wield her tray and heft the big burritos as if she'd been born to it. As on the previous day, work consumed it. And if his customers vocalized in a cascade of snorts and aspirated grunts, it was all the same to him. Back at home that night, he passed on the burrito left over from work, though he hated waste. 
and instead slipped a package of frozen meatless lasagna into the oven and poured himself not one but two drinks before he let the TV lull him to a dreamless sleep. He found himself on edge the next morning and drank a cup of tea instead of coffee and had toast only instead of his usual fried eggs with bacon, ham, or chorizo. It was dark as he drove to work, and if his headlights happened to catch a figure walking along a shadowy street or spot a face behind an oncoming windshield, he made himself look away. What next? That was all he could think. Cattle, no doubt. Huge, stinking, lowing steers speaking their own arcane language and demanding big burritos, the biggest in town. When Stanford Long's knock came this time, he was prepared or thought he was. But oh, how mistaken he turned out to be. This wasn't Stanford Wong, and it wasn't a rooster or a hog either, or a steer. It was an alien. And not one of the indocumentados of which his late sainted parents were representatives, but one of the true aliens, with their lizard skin, razor teeth, and eyeballs like ashtrays. Of course, this one was wearing Stanford Wong's clothing and was carrying a crate of lettuce but its claws were wicked and long and scraped mercilessly at the linoleum. And when it spoke, how's business? And that five pounder's gonna make you rich. It could only hiss. All day, as the aliens crowded the cafe and his own aliens, Sepide and Marta, served them their big dripping chili verde drenched burritos, he kept wondering about their spaceship and if it was like the ones in the movies, all silver and gleaming and silent, and more to the point where they parked it. No matter. The aliens lashed at their food with a snap of their gleaming teeth and a quick release of their forked tongues and the cash register rang and the line went around the block. It was around then, on that day, the third day, almost at closing time, that Sal saw a new face at the tortilla he had on the grill for the burrito he was preparing for a big square-shouldered footballer alien. This face, the brow, the blind eyes, and moving lips that swelled against the pressure of his tongs, was one that leapt out at him in its familiarity. And who was it? Not Jesus, no, but someone, someone more important even, if only to him. It was his father, the man who held him in his arms and pushed him on the swing and showed him how to grip a baseball and figure his equations in algebra. His father, dead these 30 years and more. The lips moved, and here Sal felt himself, lifted into the arena of the fantastic, moved and spoke. You're overreaching, Salvador, pressing your luck, flirting with excess and exception. When the truth is, you're not exceptional at all, but just a mule like me, made to work and live an honest, proportionate life. Go back to two pounds, Salvador, two maximum. And please, for the love of God and his angels, too, dump some aromatic salts in that bathtub. <laughs> and then the lips stopped moving in that impressive dough, and the voice faded out. But there it was. Revelation from the mouth of a flower tortilla. And the next day, despite the complaints of his customers, human beings just like him, he went back to the standard size, burrito. Trade fell off. He had to let Marta go, and then let Oscar go, too. The chickens went back to their hen houses, and the hogs to their pens, and the aliens trooped out across the lot to wherever they parked their spaceship, and whirred off into the sky in a blaze of light, still traveling as day turned to night, and the stars came out to welcome them home. Thank you. <laughs> so, for you wonderful creative writing students, a uh, number from my met today, you see what can happen just by reading an obituary? <laughs> uh, I just love this mode of storytelling, which comes from some of my heroes, like uh, Garcia Marquez, for instance, uh, and Washington Irving, my original hero. The folk tale, the tall tale, I mean, it's just so much fun for me to do this kind of story. And uh, as I was saying to some of the students today, in, in, in my aesthetic, you don't know what the story's going to be. You just see something and follow it and see what happens. And so <laughs> when it, halfway through, it began to get pretty crazy. I thought, great, let's get crazier. <laughs> but now that I've entertained you and made you so happy, I have to say that the other authors, they want to make you happy. I want to depress you.
<laughs> now I'm going to read the single most depressing story in the history of the literature. Uh, and it is uh, in the non-comic traumatic mode and it has nothing to do with burritos or the absurd. It's absolutely real. This story first appeared in the New Yorker and it's called Chicxulub. One second. <clears throat> if I can get the top off my water. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, I am an outdoors boy and I uh, split wood and my hands are still fairly strong. <laughs> <laughs> of course, the robots in the factory put super glue on these caps. <clears throat> Chicxulub. -chick -chick my daughter is walking along the roadside late at night, too late really for a 17-year-old to be out alone, even in a town as safe as this. And it is raining, the first rain of the season. The streets slip for the fine, immiscible glaze of water and petrochemicals, so that even a driver in full possession of her faculties, a driver who hasn't consumed two apple martinis and three glasses of kitchen post Pinot Noir before she got behind the wheel of her car, will have trouble keeping the thing off the sidewalk and out of the gutters, the shrubbery, the highway median, for Christ's sake. But that's not really what I want to talk about, or not yet, anyway. Have you heard of Tunguska in Russia? This was the site of the last known large body impact on the Earth's surface nearly 100 years ago. But well, that's not strictly accurate. The meteor, which was an estimated 60 yards across, never actually touched down. The force of its entry, the compression and superheating the air beneath it, caused it to explode some 25,000 feet above ground. But then the term explode hardly does justice to the event. There was a detonation, a flash, a thunderclap with a combustive power of 800 Hiroshima bombs. The earth buckled, and 700 square miles of Siberian forest were leveled in an instant. 30 miles away, reindeer in their loping herds were struck dead by the blast wave, and the clothes of a hunter another 30 miles beyond that burst into flame, even as he was polaxed to the ground. If the meteor had struck only five hours later, it would have exploded over St. Petersburg and annihilated every living thing in that glorious and Baroque city. And this was only a rock, and it was only 60 yards across. My point? You'd better get down on your knees and pray to your gods, because each year, this big spinning globe we ride intersects the orbits of some 20 million asteroids, at least a thousand of which are more than a mile in diameter. But my daughter, She's out there in the dark and the rain, walking home. Maureen and I bought her a car, a Honda Civics, the safest thing on four wheels, but the car was used, pre-owned in dealer speak. And as it happens, it's in the shop with transmission problems. And because she just had to see her friends and gossip and giggle and balance slick multicolored clumps of raw fish and pickled ginger on conjoined chopsticks at the mall, Kimberly picked her up and Kimberly will bring her home. Maddie has a cell phone. And theoretically, she could have called us, but she didn't, or that's how it appears. And so she's walking in the rain, and Alice K. Peterman of 16 Briar Lane, white, divorced, a realtor with Hyperion, who has picked at a salad and left her glasses on the bar, loses control of her vehicle. It is just past midnight. I am in bed with a book, naked and hardly able to focus on the clustered words and rigid descending paragraphs because Maureen is in the bathroom, slipping into the sheer black negligee I bought her at Victoria's Secret for her birthday. And her every sound, the creak of the medicine cabinet on its hinges, the tap running, the susurrus of the brush at her teeth, electrifies me. I've lit a candle, and I'm waiting for Maureen to step into the room so I can flick off the light. We had cocktails earlier, a bottle of wine with dinner, and we sat close on the couch and shared a joint in front of the fire because our daughter was out and we could do that and no one the wiser. I listened to the little sounds from the bathroom, seductive sounds, maddening. I am ready, more than ready. Hey, I call, pitching my voice low. Are you coming or not? You don't expect me to wait all night, do you? Her face appears in the doorway, the pale lobes of her breasts and the dark nipples visible through the clinging black silk. Oh, are you waiting for me, she says, making a game of it. She hovers at the door, and I can see the smile creep across her lips, the pleasure of the moment, drawing it out. 
Because I, I thought I might go down and work in the garden for a while. It wouldn't take long, a couple hours maybe. You know, spread a little manure, bank up some of the mulch or the roses. You'll wait for me, won't you? Then the phone rings. We stare blankly at each other through the first two rings, and then Maureen says, I better get it. And I say, no, no, forget it. It's nothing. It's nobody. But she's already moving. Forget it, I shout. And her voice drifts back to me. What if it's Maddie? And then I watch her put her lips to the receiver and whisper, hello? The night of the Tunguska explosion, the skies were unnaturally bright across Europe. As far away as London, people strolled in the parks past midnight and read novels out of doors while the sheep kept right on grazing and the birds stirred uneasily in the trees. There were no stars visible, no moon, just a pale, quivering light as if all the color had been bleached out of the sky. But of course, that midnight glow in the face of those unhappy Siberian reindeer were nothing at all compared to what would have happened if a larger object had invaded the Earth's atmosphere. On average, Objects greater than 100 yards in diameter strike the planet once every 5,000 years, and asteroids half a mile across thunder down at intervals of 300,000 years. 300,000 years is a long time in anybody's book. But if, when, such a collision occurs, the explosion will be in the million megaton range and will cloak the atmosphere in dust, thrusting the entire planet into a deep freeze and effectively stifling all plant growth for a period of a year or more. There will be no crops. No forage, no sun. There has been an accident. That is what the voice on the other end of the line is telling my wife. And the victim is Madeline Bean of 1337 Laurel Drive, according to the ID the paramedics found in her purse. The purse, with a silver clasp that has been driven half an inch into the flesh under her arm by the force of the impact, is a little thing, no bigger than a hardcover book with a ribbon-thin strap, the same purse all the girls carry as if it were part of a uniform. Is this her parent or guardian speaking? I hear my wife say, this is her mother. And then the bottom dropping out of her voice, is she? Is she? They don't answer such questions. Don't volunteer information, not over the phone. The next 10 seconds are thunderous, cataclysmic. My wife standing there numbly with the phone in her hand as if it's some unidentifiable object she's found in the street while I fumble out of bed and search for my pants. And my shoes, where are my shoes? The car keys, my wallet. This is the true panic, the loss of faith and control, the punch to the heart and the struggle for breath. I say the only thing I can think to say, she, she was in an accident? Is that what they said? She was hit by a car. She's, they don't know, in surgery. What hospital? Did they say what hospital? My wife is in motion now too. The negligee, ridiculous, unequal to the task, and she jerks it over her head and flings it to the floor, even as she snatches up a blouse, shorts, flip-flops, anything, anything to cover her nakedness and get her out the door. The dog is whining in the kitchen. There is a the sound of the rain on the roof, intensifying, hammering at the gutters. I don't bother with shoes. There are no shoes. Shoes do not exist, and my shirt hangs limply from my shoulders, unbuttoned, sagging, tails hanging loose, and we're in the car now, and the driver's side wiper is beating out of sync, and the night closing on us like a fist. And then there's Chicxulub. 65 million years ago, an asteroid, or perhaps a comet, no one is quite certain, collided with the Earth in what is now the Yucatan Peninsula. Judging from the impact crater, which is 120 miles wide, the object, this big flaming ball, was some six miles across. When it came down, day became night, and that night extended so far into the future that at least 70% of all known species were extinguished, including the dinosaurs, in nearly all their forms and array, and some 90% of the ocean's plankton, which in turn devastated the pelagic food chain. How fast was it traveling? The nearest estimates put it at 45,000 miles an hour, more than 50 times the speed of a bullet. Astrophysicists call such objects civilization enders and calculate the chances at roughly one in 10,000 that a disaster of this magnitude will occur during any individual's lifetime. The same odds as dying in an auto accident in the next six months, or more tellingly, living to be 100 in the company of your spouse. All I see are windows. An endless grid of lit windows climbing one above the other into the night as the car shoots into the emergency vehicle only lane and slides in hard against the curb. Both doors fling open simultaneously. 
Maureen is already out on the sidewalk, already slamming the door behind her and breaking into a trot, and I'm right on her heels, the keys in the ignition, and the lights stabbing at the pale underbelly of a diagonally parked ambulance. And they can have the car. Anybody can have it and keep it forever if they'll just tell me my daughter is all right. Just tell me, I mutter, hurrying, out of breath. Just tell me, and it's yours. And this is a prayer, the first in a long, discontinuous string addressed to whomever or whatever may be listening. Overhead, the sky is having a seizure, black above, quicksilver below, the rain coming down in wind-blown arcs. And I wouldn't even notice, but for the fact that we are suddenly, instantly wet, our hair knotted and clinging, and our clothes stuck like flypapers, flypaper to the slick tegument of our skin. In we come, side by side, through the doors that jolt back from us in alarm, and all I can think is that the hospital is a death factory, and that we have come to it like the walking dead, haggard, sallow, shoeless. My daughter, I say to the nurse at the admittance desk. She's, they called, you called. She's been in an accident. Maureen is at my side, tugging at the fingers of one hand as if she's trying to remove an invisible glove. A car? A car accident? Name, the nurse asks. How about this nurse? She's young, Filipina, with opaque eyes and the bone structure of a cadaver. Every day she sees death and it blinds her. She doesn't see us. She sees a computer screen. She sees the TV monitor mounted in the corner and the shadows that pass there. She sees the walls, the floor, the naked light of the fluorescent tube. But not us, not us. For one resounding moment that thumps in my ears and then thumps again, I can't remember my daughter's name. I can picture her leaning into the mound of textbooks spread out on the dining room table, the glow of the overhead light making a nimbus of her hair as she glances up at me with a glum look and half a rueful smile as if to say, it's all in a day's work for a teenager, Dad, and you're lucky you're not in high school anymore. But her name is gone. Maddie, my wife says, Madeline Bean? I watch, mesmerized, as the nurse's fleshless fingers maneuver the mouse, her eyes fixed on the screen before her. A click, another click. The eyes lift to take us in, even as they dodge away again. She's still in surgery, she says. Maureen's voice cuts in then, elemental, chilling, and it's not a question she's posing, not a statement or demand, but a plea. What's wrong with her? Another click, but this is just for show and the eyes never moved from the screen. There was an accident, the nurse says. She was brought in by the paramedics. That's all I can tell you. It is then that I become aware that we are not alone, that there are others milling around the room, other zombies like us, hurriedly dressed and streaming water till the beige carp is black. And why, I wonder, do I despise this nurse more than any human being I've ever encountered? This young woman, not much older than my daughter, with her hair pulled back in a bun and a white cap like a party favor perched atop it, who was just doing her job? Why do I want to reach out across the counter that separates us and awaken her to a swift, sure knowledge of hate and fear and pain? Why? Ted, Maureen says, and I feel her grip at my elbow. And then we're moving again, hurrying, sweeping, practically running out of this place down a corridor under the glare of the lights that are a kind of death in themselves, and into a worse place, a far worse place. The thing that worries me about Chicxulub, aside from the fact that it erased the dinosaurs and brought catastrophic and irreversible change, is the deeper implication that we and all our works and worries and attachments are so utterly inconsequential. Death cancels our individuality, we know that, yes. But ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, and the kind goes on. Human life and culture succeed us. That, in the absence of God, is what allows us to accept the death of the individual. But when you throw Chicxulub into the mix, or the next Chicxulub, the Chicxulub that could come howling down to obliterate all and everything, even as your eyes skim the lines of this page, where does that leave us? You're the parents? We are in another room, gone deeper now, the walls closing in, the loudspeakers murmuring their eternal incantations. Dr. Chandra Soma to emergency, Dr. Bell paging Dr. Bell. And here is another nurse, grimmer, older, with lines like the strings of a tobacco pouch pulled tight round her lips. She's addressing us, me and my wife, but I have nothing to say, either in denial or affirmation. If I claim Maddie as my own, and I'm making deals again, then I'm sure to jinx her, because those powers that might or might not be, those gods of the infinite and the minute, 
Well, see how desperately I love her, and they'll take her away just to spite me for not believing in them. Voodoo, hoodoo, santeria, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. I hear Maureen's voice emerging from a locked vault, the single whispered monosyllable, and then, is she going to be all right? I don't have that information, the nurse says, and her voice is neutral, robotic even. This is not her daughter. Her daughter's at home, asleep in a pile of teddy bears, pink sheets, fluffy pillows, the nightlight glowing like the all-seeing eye of a sentinel. I can't help myself. It's that neutrality, that maddening clinical neutrality. And can't anybody take any responsibility for anything? What information do you have, I say? And maybe I'm too loud. Maybe I am. It's your job, for Christ's sake, to know what's going on here. You call us up in the middle of the night. Our daughter's hurt. She's been in an accident. And you tell me you don't have any fucking information? People turn their heads. Eyes burn into us. They're slouched in orange plastic chairs, stretched out on the floor, praying, pacing, their lips moving in silence. They want information, too. We all want information. We want news, good news. It was all a mistake, minor cuts and bruises, contusions, that's the word. And your daughter, son, husband, grandmother, first cousin, twice removed, will be walking through that door over there any minute. The nurse drills me with a look, and then she's coming out from behind the desk. A short one, dumpy, almost a dwarf and striding briskly to a door which swings open on another room, deeper yet. If you just follow me, please, she says. Suddenly, sheepish, I duck my head and comply, two steps behind Maureen. This room is smaller, an examining room, with a set of scales and charts on the walls and its slab of a table covered with a sheet of antiseptic paper. Wait here, the nurse tells us, already shifting her weight to make her escape. The doctor will be in in a minute. What doctor, I want to know? What for? What does he want? But the door has already drawn closed. I turn to Maureen. She's standing there in the middle of the room, afraid to touch anything or to sit down or even move for fear of breaking the spell. She's listening for footsteps, her eyes fixed on the door. I hear myself murmur her name, and then she's in my arms, sobbing. And I know I should hold her, know that we both need it, the human contact, the love and support. But all, all I feel is the burden of her. There is nothing and no one that can make this better. Can't she see that? I don't want to console or be consoled. I don't want to be touched. I just want my daughter back. Maureen's voice comes from so deep in her throat, I can barely make out what she's saying. It takes a second to register. Even as she pulls away from me, her face crumpled and red, and this is her prayer, whispered aloud. She's going to be all right, isn't she? Sure, I say, sure she is, she'll be fine. She'll have some bruises, that's for sure. Maybe a couple of broken bones even. And I trail off, trying to picture it. The crutches, the cast, the band-aids, the goals. Our daughter returned to us in a halo of shimmering light. Maybe she broke her arm. She could break her arm, uh, that would, or, or even her leg. But why would she be in surgery? Why would she be in surgery so long? Why, why would that be? I don't have an answer to that. I don't want to have an answer. It was a car, Maureen says. A car, Ted, a car hit her. The room seems to tick and buzz with the fading energy of the larger edifice. And I can't help thinking of the conjuries of wires strung inside the walls, the cables bringing power to the x-ray lab, the EKG and EEG machines, the life support systems, and of the myriad pipes and the fluids they drain. A car. 3,000 pounds of steel, chrome, glass, iron. What was she even doing walking like that? She knows better than that. My wife nods, the wet ropes of her hair beating at her shoulders like the flails of the penitents. She probably had a fight with Kimberly. I'll bet that's it. I'll bet anything. Where is the son of a bitch? I snarled. This doctor, where is he? We're in that room in that purgatory of a room for a good hour or more. Twice, I thrust my head out the door to give the nurse an annihilating look, but there is no news, no doctor, nothing. And then, at quarter past two, the inner door swings open, and there he is, a man too young to be a doctor, an infant with a smooth, bland face and hair that rides a wave up off his brow, and he doesn't have to say a thing, not a word, because I can see what he's bringing us, and my heart seizes with the shock of it. 
He looks to Maureen, looks to me, then drops his eyes. I'm sorry, he says. When it comes, the meteor will punch through the atmosphere and strike the Earth in the space of a single second, vaporizing on impact and creating a fireball that will, in that moment, achieve temperatures of 60,000 Kelvin, or 10 times the surface reading of the sun. If it is chicxulub sized and it hits one of our land masses, some 200,000 cubic kilometers of the Earth's surface will be thrust up into the atmosphere, even as the thermal radiation of the blast sets fire to the Earth's cities and forests. This will be succeeded by seismic and volcanic activity on a scale unknown in human history, and then by the dark night of cosmic winter. If it should land in the sea, as the Chicxulub meteor did, it would spew superheated water into the atmosphere instead, extinguishing the light of the sun and triggering the same scenario of seismic catastrophe and eternal winter, while simultaneously sending out a rippling ring of water three miles high to rock the continents as if they were saucers in a dish pan. So what does it matter? What does anything matter? We are powerless. We are bereft. And the gods, all the gods of all the ages combined, are nothing but a rumor. The gurney is a focal point in a room of gurneys, people laid out as if they'd been a war, the beaked noses of the victims poking up out of a maze of sheets like a series of topographic blips on a glaciated plain. These people are alive still. Fluids dripping into their veins, machines monitoring their vital signs, nurses hovering over them like ghouls. But they'll be dead soon, all of them. That much is clear. But the gurney, the one against the back wall with the sheet pulled up over the impossibly small and reduced form, this is all that matters. The doctor leads us across the room, speaking in a low voice of internal injuries, a ruptured spleen, trauma to the brainstem, and I can barely control my feet. Can I tell you how hard it is to lift this sheet? Thin percale, and it might as well be made of lead, iron, iridium, might as well be the repository of all the dark matter in the universe. The doctor steps back, hands folded before him. The entire room, or triage ward, or whatever it is, holds its breath. Maureen moves in beside me till our shoulders are touching, till I can feel the flesh and the heat of her pat pressing into me. And I think of this child we made together, this thing under the sheet, and the hand clenches at the end of my arm, the fingers there, prehensile, taking hold. The sheet draws back, millimeter by millimeter, the slow, stripped tease of death. And I can't do this, I can't, until Marie lunges forward and jerks the thing off in a sudden, violent motion. It takes us a moment. The shock of the bloated and discolored flesh, the crusted map of blood at the temple, and the rag of the hair, the obscene violation of everything we know and expect and love, before the surge of joy hits us. Maddie is a redhead, like her mother, and though she's 17, she's as rangy and thin as a child with oversized hands and feet, and she never did pierce that smooth, sweet run of flesh beneath her lower lip. I can't speak. I'm rushing still with the euphoria of this new mainline drug I've discovered, soaring over the room, the hospital, the whole planet. Maureen says it for me. This is not our daughter. Our daughter is not in the hospital. Our daughter is asleep in her room beneath the benevolent gaze of the posters on the wall, Brittany and Brad and Justin, her things scattered around her as if laid out for a rummage sale. Our daughter has, in fact, gone to Hana Sushi at the mall, as planned, and Kimberly has driven her home. Our daughter has, unbeknownst to us or anyone else, fudged the rules a bit. The smallest thing in the world, nothing really, the sort of thing every teenager does without thinking twice. She has loaned her ID to her second best friend, Christy Cherwin, because Christy is 16 and Christy wants to see, is dying to see, the movie at the Cineplex with Brad Pitt in it, the one rated NC-17. Our daughter doesn't know we've been to the hospital, doesn't know about Alice Kate Peterman and the Pinot Noir and the glasses left on the bar, doesn't know that even now the phone is ringing at the Cherwins. I am sitting on the couch with a drink, staring into the ashes of the fire. Maureen is in the kitchen with a mug of Ovaltine gazing vacantly out the window, where the first streaks of light have begun to limb the trunks of the trees. I try to picture the Churlins. They've been to the house a few times, Ed and Lucinda. And I draw a blank until a backlit scene from the past presents itself. A cookout at their place. 
The adults gather round the grill with gin and tonics, the radio playing some forgotten song. The children, our daughters, riding their bikes up and down the cobbled drive, making a game of it, spinning, dodging, lifting the front wheels from the ground even as their hair fans out behind them and the sun crashes through the trees. Flip a coin 10 times and it could turn up heads 10 times in a row, or not once. The rock is coming, the new chikshu, hurtling through the dark and the cold to remake our fate. But not tonight, not for me. For the Cherwins, it's already here. Thank you. barely get out the last page, but thank you so much. A couple questions? Sure. Happily. We go have to change the mood here or we'll just kill ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, shout out the questions and I'll repeat them if people can't hear. Uh, whatever you like. Uh, no math questions, though, please. <laughs> yes? So you told us the inspiration for the five-pound burrito story. What was the inspiration for It didn't happen to me. I'm projecting. I am just projecting. Uh, of course, the inspiration is, I have a daughter myself, and all parents, of course, worry about such things. I'll tell you a quick story. So, you know, I wasn't always this distinguished man standing before you, speaking beautifully. I was a punk, an arrant punk and teenager, and, and my mother had me when she was 23, so I, in all, later life, I would go back and do the math, um, so I'm like, I don't know, she was like this elderly hag of 38 or something who knew nothing about sex, love, the world, and I'd been out wild with my friends till late at night doing a lot of bad things that are dangerous, but I'm immortal, how's it gonna hurt me? I came back home at four in the morning and there was the light of her cigarette in the darkened living room and she spoke to me and I said, wow, what, what are you doing up? And she said, I was worried about you. I was staggered. Me? What could happen to me? So that's part of it, too. <laughs> <laughs> Others? Yes? Um, I liked your short story, so it seemed for its relevant remarks on climate change. I thought it was a particularly effective talk from a 16 year old voice in the field. Um, how do you choose which point of view to tell your stories from? Okay, great question. So I don't know if you all heard it. This wonderful young woman has praised me for my story. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, for those in the front who didn't hear it all, it, it's an elaborate praise. I mean, it's, <laughs> and it's told from the point of view of a teenage boy who is in love with a girl in this village that is sinking and is going to be evacuated. And she, furthermore, is going away to college if he's not. And it's a kind of tragic thing for him emotionally. But meanwhile, it's a story about global warming and the rising of the seas. Uh, in the, the book of the Lit Box, which many of you, you have read, I, I pride myself on having multiple points of view of different ages of characters. There's also a story about an old man in there. Uh, there are stories from the point of view of young women. And there are also different points of view. Or like the, what you heard tonight of uh, uh, the Five Pamorito. Um, I think it's a challenge to do something you haven't done before, to push your limits, and I want to tell stories from the points of view of everybody, and I can't explain how it happens. Uh, I knew about Surtsey, I knew I've been writing about climate change for a long time, I knew that this island, Kivalina, was sinking and they were going to have to move uh, the people who live there. Um, and it just came to me. It just started to come to me, this voice of the boy who's bailing. The opening line is bailing and bailing in the house, and why is he doing this? Because they all have to evacuate. And it went on from there. Because after all, it'd be hard for you to believe, but I too was a young boy one time. 
and what I wanted was sex and love and love as well. So I just put myself into his position. And it's much sadder because his girlfriend's going away and not only that, but the uh, whole place where he's lived his whole life and everything is going to vanish. But, but you don't worry about climate change. It's fake news. It's not climate change. So one or two more? Let's have two more questions. OK, so anybody? This is your chance. I mean, maybe I'll come back in 10 years again. You can ask me then, but this is your chance. Anything else? Yes. How do you know when a story is done, when you don't want to tweak one more word, or, mm. or do you ever get to that point? Yeah, good question. How do I know when a story is done, when it's finished, you're not going to tweak anymore, you're not going to obsess over it? Wow. Uh, it's a magical moment. It's a thrill. It just happens to you. Uh, for instance, the ending of The Tortilla Curtain, which I know many of you have read, uh, people always ask me, well, what does this mean, and, and why does it end with this gesture? Because obviously there's a lot more story coming. I thought there was going to be more story coming. And when I got to that line, that last line when he reaches out his arm, uh, I realized that this is the ending. That's it. We don't need it anymore. You know the rest of the story. You know what's happening. And that gesture pulls you back into the book again to review its themes in that moment. So in that case, it's it's very powerful. In other novels, like some of my historical novels, like The Room to Elville, for instance, there's a coda, and they tell you what happened to all the characters. Each one is completely different, each story. Final question. Yes? How did you come upon being a writer? It's a long story. Uh, let's see, uh, take me till just past midnight. Are the doors locked? Make sure doors locked. Uh, in short, in short. Uh, I uh, told this to the students earlier, and I think to the people the other night at the, uh, in New York. I love being here and being with you. I love the idea of a liberal arts education. It's the most important thing we have. So I'm a working class kid. I'm the first of our family ever to go to college. All my education is from public universities. I grew up in New York, and I went to SUNY Potsdam. That is the music school of State University of New York. However, I flunked my audition because I didn't have a sense. I could play the hell out of my instrument. I didn't have a saxophone. I didn't have a sense of the kind of music they expected us to play, which was classical music. Uh, so I'm in a liberal arts college. I always loved history. I declared a history major. Second year, went and took a course in American short story and discovered Flannery O'Connor. I became a double major, history and English. Third year, I blundered into a creative writing class, found a mentor, and uh, here I am. <laughs> so again, uh, I think it's, I think everybody oh, should have the privilege of being in a liberal arts college. It's meant so much to me, it transformed my life. And I, again, I didn't know about writing or that writers were living and breathing and created texts that can transform you together, I, I, all together. I just thought, well, you know, it's something you read in a textbook and you have to write an essay on it. And it just changed my life. So, congratulations to all of you. <laughs> and thank you very much.